All right, welcome again to everybody. And um, this is the, um, I, I believe it's the second webinar that we've done in the Restorative Justice webinar series this spring. And uh, today we're going to be talking with Anne Marie Early uh, about the power of connection and attachment theory and practice of restorative justice. My name is Brian Gum, and I am the um, technology facilitator for this webinar series. I'm also a former student of Howard's, and I also have a, uh, a connection to our guest today, Anne Marie. My wife is a graduate of the counseling program at Eastern Mennonite University, and so Anne Marie was one of my wife's professors. So this is a, this is a fun one to be on today. So. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about how to use the technology uh, that we have today for this webinar and how you can participate in the conversation. Um, you will see and hear me and Anne-Marie and Howard and later Sarah um, in a webinar, uh, but all the other folks here, the attendees, will um, you will not be able to be uh, speak with your voice, but if you look down in the bottom right hand corner of the WebEx uh, application, you should see a little chat section and it might be minimized. So you might have to click a few <laughs> buttons to make it visible. Um, and that is how you will be able to participate in the conversation today. And um, I wanna specifically direct your attention to the send to option that appears right above where you type in messages. And if you'd like to uh, ask a question or make an observation throughout the course of the webinar, um, you can type in that, in that little text sec section down in the bottom right hand corner. And if you select from the send to drop down menu, and select Sarah Rothschank. Uh, Sarah is responsible for kind of collecting all the comments and questions over the course of the webinar. And then she feeds those to Howard and Howard can interject those questions or comments um, at appropriate points in the conversation. So that gives you, the attendees, a little bit of a voice in here too, which we certainly welcome uh, and want to encourage you to do. So with that little um, piece of technology orientation out of the way, I will go ahead and turn things over to Howard. Well, uh, I was going to say good afternoon, but uh, some of you may not be in uh, the place where it is afternoon, but welcome anyway. And I hope it's warmer where you are than here. Uh, it's been pretty cold. Uh, welcome to the, this first of our fall and, and spring seminars. We have, uh, I think, five or six of them scheduled uh, and are looking forward to them. And I'm particularly pleased today to be talking about attachment theory with my friend, Anne-Marie Early. Um, Anne-Marie uh, is a professor of counseling here at EMU in the counseling department, as uh, Brian said. She's a licensed family and uh, marriage therapist, certified emotionally focused couple therapy trainer supervisor. If you wanna know what that is, type it into Sarah and we'll get an answer to the question. Um, one of the things I like in one of the resumes I read, I said two paragraphs I like, I'm going to read for you. Her academic scholarship and clinical practice are informed by effective neuroscience and attachment theory, as well as the importance of embodied experiential practices in creating change. Anne Marie has specialized training in depth psychology and worked with dreams, myth, and story in her personal and professional life as a way of listening deeply to the song of the soul. I like that phrase, the song of the soul. She and uh, her husband, uh, Christian, have, have uh, edited a recent book that came out of a conference that they helped organize uh, here at EMU a couple years ago called Integrating the New Science of Love and a Spirituality of Peace, Becoming Human Again. Uh, it's got some fascinating uh, papers by various specialists uh, related to these topics. So uh, greetings and welcome, Anne-Marie. Uh, glad to have you here today and looking forward to our conversation. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, that is particularly the things, that you, the life experiences or the context in which you are that informs what you're going to, what you do and what you're going to tell us today. Well, it's good to be with you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Wonderful. 
Um, so I would have to go back to the mid 1990s when I was living in Los Angeles, and um, I uh, started a clinical practice. I was working with trauma uh, with individuals, working as a couples therapist. Uh, and um, I was working from a lot of different models trying to, to do intervention with people. And I met uh, who became my trainer, Dr. Susan Johnson, uh, and she introduced me to emotion-focused therapy for couples. And it was a new model that's evidence-based, and it was using this thing called attachment theory that I had never been trained in in my clinical or my graduate education, master's or PhD. And as I began to understand more about attachment and the more we learned from neuroscience, it became not only a lens to understand my clients, but really a lens to be able to see the world. Uh, and I saw that it had incredible capacity to both explain things that were happening for people and also to describe ways of actually intervening. And the thing that I liked best about it uh, is that it was uh, a universal theory, and we'll talk about that today, that it is just based on us being mammals and how we're wired. Uh, so it had fantastic cross-cultural, um, you have to apply it differently in different contexts, but we're talking about the same phenomena. So since then, um, I, I train in the uh, EFT model. I talk widely uh, about attachment theory in just about any context you can imagine, applying it to all kinds of things. It is useful in my own life, uh, which is something that tells me that it's actually a useful theory. But what's been fun in the past couple of years is beginning to engage and teach at CJP and talk to the students there. And they give me their case studies and we talk about it and we begin to apply it. So Christian and I not only did this conference here at ENU where we brought Dan Siegel, who uh, is a leader in the field, and uh, my trainer, Dr. Susan Johnson, a neuroscientist from UVA, uh, Jim Cohen. We also brought John Paul Lederoff talking about conflict transformation and an ethicist, Nancy Murphy. Uh, but uh, so having those conversations, uh, but we also kind of dipped our finger into conflict resolution and uh, wrote an article in the ACR magazine. And it just got us thinking about this and then conversations with you, Howard, as well. So it's fun to be here and begin to apply this one more place uh, and then have these practitioners, uh, all of you who are listening today, uh, find ways of actually um, applying it with great specificity in your context. I know, I know it's been an eye opener for me, uh, both professionally and in my personal life. So uh, I'm really looking forward to hear what you have to say today as well. Well, tell us what it is. What, and what, we'll talk later about restorative zest. Well, what is it? What is this thing? It doesn't have anything with the chemistry of glue or anything like that. <laughs> Maybe it does. <laughs> <laughs> Good. All right. Well, let me go ahead and bring my. Um, my PowerPoint up, and um, I'll just go through some of the basics of attachment theory uh, and begin to talk about um, some of what, uh, what are key. Um, so probably the pace that I would begin uh, is to, to, to make the argument uh, and, and the claim that it's a wired-in system. So when we talk about attachment, we're not just talking about a theory. We now have over 17,000 empirical studies um, of attachment. So I would, I would begin by saying it's a biological given. It's this innate psychobiological system, and really it's about our way of staying alive as mammals in the world, and we'll pull this apart uh, and talk about what that actually means. Um, and one of the keys, especially as we're gonna be applying it uh, in this context, is we really seek our others, and we'll talk about what that means, during times of stress. And so when people are there for us during times of stress, we feel safe and secure, and when they're not, certain things happen inside of us. And then we connect this other piece, which is attachment is really about regulation. It's about how we deal with all of these things that are going on in the inside, especially the sense of safety and danger, uh, and the history that we bring with us uh, with that. So if you remember nothing else from today, uh, this question is key. And for those of you who are listening with us today, I want you to think about your own life. And I would call this the, the key attachment question. It's really the fulcrum um, that um, key moments in time um, rest on. It's will you be there for me when I need you? And if you think about your own life, um, I am imagining in, since I've done this for years and years, that you can think of moments where people have been there for you and times when people haven't been there for you. And the consequences of that when we know that this is actually kind of the pinpoint of what's significant, helps us to really see what goes right 
and what goes wrong. And any good movie you've seen recently, this question uh, will be in there some way, um, either with a positive answer or a negative one. So that key phrase, will you be there for me when I really need you? It's about these components. It is accessibility, can I get to you? And responsiveness, will you respond to me when I reach out to you? It's whether there's that emotional engagement and contact that actually shows up. And it's based on the research of John Bowlby. And John Bowlby uh, was a British psychoanalyst uh, during um, the 1950s. Um, and he was working with children. And he was hired by the World Health Organization after World War II to work with war or orphans. And he made, at that point, what was a tremendously radical claim. And that is that the actual relationship between caretaker and child is what is significant, not just the imagined relationship in the mind. And as he began to study these war orphans, he realized that those who did not have their primary caretaker had consequences. So he talks about safe haven and secure base. Safe haven is when you have this sense of, of a place that you can return to, it's a buffer against stress then you're gonna do better in the world. And a secure base is a place where you have security, you can go out and explore the world and come back again. So will you be there for me when I really need you? You need a sense of accessibility, I can get to you. Responsiveness, you'll respond to me. Safe haven and secure base. But for these children, what had happened, what they had been ripped from their primary caretakers, and these, uh, and some of you may have actually seen the movie, The Two-Year-Old Goes to the Hospital, um, and it shows the same separation distress. What happens first is people protest being kind of ripped away from their caretakers. Then it leads to this clinging and seeking, trying to find that person. It leads to this inner sense of despair and depression that sets in. And eventually what happens is people detach. It's just too much to stay in that place of um, disorientation. Um, and the consequences of detachment, and this will be very um, applicable with restorative justice, is people lose the capacity for empathy. And when you lose the capacity for empathy, it's not because they're bad people, it's because they've shut down the system. You can actually then perpetrate violence without having uh, emotional response to that. So Bowlby pointed this to us, but people didn't like that. He was talking about these internalized working models that are created inside of somebody by these early childhood relationships. But he talked about from cradle to grave. They're the things that actually impact us over the lifespan. And so with neuroscience and with what we're learning today, attachment theory has really not, uh, it's no longer just a theory. Uh, it's, a way, it's a meta way to actually see what's happening dynamically for people. Uh, and um, this accessibility responsiveness, this organization on the inside, um, actually leads to most of the, the mental health and psychopathology issues that, that we would name today um, that, that are kind of an issue. So it's, it's an innate motivating force. It's based on these things, accessibility, responsiveness. That's what builds bonds and security. Anytime you have a sense of fear and uncertainty, it's going to activate those attachment bonds. If you have a history where you have people that were there for you, will you be there for me when I really need you? You can actually use that as a resource in the here and now. Bring that into a stressful situation to help you. But for people who don't have that, and there's a large population uh, with, with, for all of us, um, some of us watching today know what that feels like, it actually sets you up to be much more um, insecure in the here and now. And any isolation and loss is just inherently traumatizing. And we need our attachment figures to be there for us. And I'm not going to talk about it today, but there are what we call attachment styles, characteristic ways of being in the world. And if you know what those are, then you're going to be able to, to, to make sense of um, kind of what, uh, what might actually be dynamically going on in the situation. And as I kind of close just talking about this, what I want to say is when you look through an attachment lens, what's wonderful is um, it's depathologizing because all behavior makes sense in context, and context helps us make sense of behavior. So with this lens, instead of trying to explain what's going on and putting that on somebody, instead it opens up space and actually helps us to make greater sense of, of kind of what this, what this is. 
So it, it rests on this, will you be there for me when I really need you? And what we'll pull out as we talk about restorative justice is that attunement, that ability to let somebody know that you're really there with them is crucial uh, in attachment. Uh, and it's also um, secure attachment is built on the music of rupture and repair, which means we don't have to get it right in the beginning. We just have to be able to go back and fix our mistakes and actually create bonding events where there were ruptures before. Howard, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, I said, what does all this have to do then with restorative justice? What? Okay. What do you do? <laughs> Take us to the next step. Absolutely. I'd be happy to. So, um, I mean, it's a little intimidating to sit here because I know I've got practitioners listening who do this every day. Uh, so what I say to the students in the Center for Justice and Peace Building is you guys are the experts. So I don't want to talk about the pragmatics of restorative justice today. What I would love to do instead is to talk about the process. And what I'd like to introduce is some concepts and some ideas that will help us to look differently at the work that you might be doing um, and hopefully point to some places that maybe are new or things that, that these are just new labels for things that you're already doing. So as we jump into restorative justice, what I, what I want to talk about is the inside, which is inside the person, inside you, the practitioner, what happens in the in-between, and then what's the larger context, looking at key processes, key moments where things happen, and then key patterns that actually create um, different kinds of dynamics uh, in the work that you're doing. So I, I, as I was thinking about this presentation, I could have started with any one of these. Um, and because each of them, it's not, it's not linear. They're, they're kind of these different spokes of this hub. Um, but I, I decided to begin this process and to really ask the question, when you're, when you're working in this context of restorative justice, what's really going on? And I know in the clinical world, we often give spurious reasons for what we want to name is actually going on um, and because it makes us feel comfortable. Um, but what I want to name is the explicit, which is the realm we usually deal with, is tremendously significant. I don't want to say that that's not important. Uh, the words that we speak and the sense that we make it is, is incredibly important. But I also want to point us to some other things that I think are tremendously significant. And one of them is the implicit, where we attend not just to what people are saying, but the dynamics underneath the surface. Uh, and that has to do with what we're going to call felt sensing and attunement and resonance. I also just want to talk about social intelligence very briefly and, and talk about what Dan Goldman talks about with what needs to happen with social intelligence. And then put our finger on kind of safety and danger, what happens with fight, flight, and freeze. Uh, and I'll introduce you to this concept um, of the window of arousal. But it's been so helpful. We're, we're just at the very beginning of understanding kind of with neuroscience what's going on. And I, I don't want to make huge leaps and I'm not a neuroscientist. But what, some of what's happened is, first of all, it shows us the brain can change, which is tremendously good news. Uh, when I was in my training, we didn't know that that was actually true. And it's begun to point us to this procedural implicit place. And I can't show videos here on WebEx, but um, there's a uh, analyst, his name is Ian McGilchrist, who talks about right hemisphere and left hemisphere activation. A wonderful book called The Master and His Emissary. He's got one of those RSA videos that you can find on YouTube uh, if you look him up. And it really talks about how our culture um, has valued the linear left hemisphere language part of us. But the, the, and, and we've made that the master. But what he argues is the master is actually really this right hemisphere place, which is much more kind of open and observing, relationally connected, holding all kinds of pieces of information. And what I want to talk about today is I think that's the place that we need to train ourselves more in. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about left versus right um, activation of your frontal lobe right now, but that we'll talk about that uh, in kind of how can you grow um, as a practitioner. So in my training, this is the place that I, that I learned from. We learned about concepts. We learned about ideas. It's the form. It's the language. 
uh, kind of the, the scripted part um, um, that, that is all of the practice and all of the information that you bring with you. But there's this other place, which is the implicit, which I've been doing more research and study and reading on because this kind of knowing, though it's not, doesn't have the same specificity, can gather information very quickly. It's the instinctive, intuitive, it's the emotional and wordless. It's that place of senses. And with social intelligence, that's what Dan Bowen is talking about. And he splits it into two categories, social awareness and social facility. So he talks about social awareness is the spectrum that runs from instantaneously sensing another's inner state to understanding her feelings and thoughts to getting complicated social situations. That's absolutely the place where restorative justice. So you're dealing with the content, but you're having to hold all of these different dynamics and emotions and, and put this sensibility together. But he goes on to say, simply sensing how another feels or knowing what they think or intend does not guarantee fruitful interactions. Social facility builds on social awareness to allow smooth, effective interaction. So I can't pull apart all of what Dan Goldman talks about in, in social intelligence and there's some great resources and just reading his book would be a fantastic resource. But as we begin to talk about restorative justice, this kind of systemic work where we're holding all of these complex dynamics takes social intelligence, takes the ability to pay attention to that implicit realm. It also takes the ability to deal with your own inner world and all of what gets churned up. And we'll talk more about are you under-regulated, which means you get really anxious in situations. Are you under-regulated, over-regulated, which means you're pretty calm and, and cool and collected, but not maybe as available as you could be. Can you stay present during stress? And we'll talk a little bit more about rupture and repair. And all of this is about holding space. Holding space, this, this kind of systemic work really, really demands that. And when we talk about arousal, this is, um, uh, this is a complete, he, uh, Stephen Porges is a researcher who uh, 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 talks about polyvagal theory. Um, for, for our purposes today, what we want to do in order to help people to be able to effectively engage us as practitioners is to be in what we're calling the window of tolerance. It's the social engagement which uses the attachment system. That's what he calls the optimum arousal zone. If you have too much going on and there's too much anxiety, you're going to be in fight, flight, and freeze, and you're going to be aroused, and you're going to be too hyper aroused. If you're too low and you're just kind of shut down, there's not enough going on. So we're always looking as practitioners to work in this window of tolerance where we use social engagement. There's not too much going on that we're too, too kind of, and that's for us or, or the people we're working with. And it's not so shut down. Uh, that that there's nothing going on. And this is based on the fact that your amygdala, which is that emotion center that is fight, fight, and freeze, actually processes information two and a half times more quickly than the neocortex. So it's acting and reacting before you can actually think about what's going on. So it's kind of like if we were walking up in the woods today and out having a really nice hike and all of a sudden something happened, you would be acting and reacting before you looked at the ground and said, that's a snake, snakes are dangerous. Well, that very same dynamic happens when we're working with people when they get activated in that fight, flight, and freeze. So we've got this process. So what I'm trying to argue is we've got this attachment system. We have these wired in needs to be socially connected. Too often, we're trained to pay attention just to the explicit realm, not move it to the implicit where all of those dynamics are actually at work. Or we're working with people in that optimum level of arousal, people who get too flooded and we don't know what to do, or not enough going on, and that feels overwhelming. And then the next piece is that sometimes, at least for me, I don't, I don't pay attention to the moment the way that I need to. I don't pay attention to these. And so I, I call it moments in time as markers. Markers have meaning. They actually create changes in our brain positively, but too often negatively, where because we're so trained that explicit is what's important, we're actually not working with that more implicit system, and people are in this place, and we try to get them to think their way out of a stuck place. Now, I think for you as, as, as practitioners in restorative justice, 
you're you're in this emotional realm um, maybe more than others. Uh, but there's this wonderful um, researcher who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, Dan Stern, who wrote this beautiful book called uh, The Present Moment in Psychotherapy and Everyday Life. And he names this term called moments of meeting. And he calls that he says this is the difference between chronos moments and kairos moments. These moments that are that are just pregnant with possibility. And that he and he is a baby watcher and a pregnant baby watcher who used to watch these mother infant interactions. And he talks about the incredible importance of paying attention to these moments of meeting. And he's talking about these moments where where things actually happen and are alive. So they can be beautiful things that bring bonding events for people. They can also be the moments in time that create these ruptures, that pull people apart, that keep people from being able to connect. And so that moves us from just talking about the process, where I'm trying to point us more toward the implicit, to the context. So as practitioners, it's tremendously significant that we see these key moments that define dynamics and that we have a way of really making sense of them. So making sense of that implicit as well as explicit, but I'm also going to introduce you to a term called attachment injury. And it's something that was developed out of Sue Johnson's work, my trainer in emotion focused couples therapy. But since learning and working with it in therapy and, and training in this model, it has incredible application value uh, to many contexts, but I believe especially in restorative justice, because this is, this is the realm you are working in. So we're going to take the dyad and talk about kind of dyad attachment injuries and then talk about how they can actually help, um, help to heal and also how they can actually grow a situation and make them much, much, much more complicated. So an attachment injury is a moment in time uh, that creates a rupture. Uh, and what happens is it defines a relationship that either once was safe as dangerous um, or a relationship that you weren't sure about uh, and makes it, it in that moment in time feel actually very dangerous. And it's that based on that question that we talked about earlier when we were talking about attachment. Will you be there for me when I really need you? So it's a betrayal of trust or an abandonment at a crucial moment of need. And it's a form of relationship trauma and it defines the relationship as insecure. So let's just pause here for a moment and I want you to think. Think about your own life. Think about places in your own life where you've had bonding experiences where people have been with you and places where maybe ruptures have happened, broken relationships, um, something that created distress for you. Uh, in the context that you're working in, there are major ruptures that have happened. But then there are these micro ruptures that follow that create patterns that get ingrained. So it can be just between a dyad, but too often it then gets put into the system somehow, the family system, the cultural system, the larger national system. Uh, one of these ruptures can have huge implications for society as well. This is also significant when you're trying to recreate a contact between two people who have had an injury. That if we're not watching for these markers in that work, we can actually re-injure or we can be the one who injures because we're not there the way the person needs. And so knowing about this phenomenon can actually help you to work more effectively and, and to name them and to work with them. So let's talk about what they are. So it's these moments of rupture. And what happens in these moments is these injuries, they can be historical, they can be from 25 years ago, show up in the here and now. So it could be not just about uh, what's happening now, it could be something that just comes flooding into the here and now from history. And they appear in the present as if they're as alive as they were back then. So it's almost like a traumatic flashback. But what happens is it gets compounded when the other doesn't even know what's going on and they don't respond in an accessible and responsive way, again, being there and responding. And, and that reaching out actually fails and it actually creates even a bigger rupture. And it creates this downward spiral, spiral and it creates in the body this indelible imprint where the only way out is through, which means you actually have to deal with it to get over it. And it's about this disconnection. So it can be a specific incident or it can be a symbolic marker. And too often explicitly, we think we know what actually happened or went wrong, but too often that's not what it is. 
often we have to we have to actually ask a particular question that I'll teach you to figure out what the moment is. So we often put our own ideas of what we think the moment is, and it's often not actually that. So what you want to ask, and I want you to maybe you can think about a clinic, a situation that you're dealing with, or something personal that's happened to you in the past. But this is what we ask, and you'll know it instantly. It's that implicit sense. Was there ever a moment in time when you felt like blank wasn't there for you? And it can be something historical, or it can be something current. And so if I was to ask you, was there ever a moment in time that you felt like blank wasn't there for you? You will have the rupture show up. You will see what it is. So a clinical example would be, um, in my context, where maybe a husband and wife are, are struggling, and uh, Sue Johnson tells the story of where the um, wife um, comes home uh, and is sitting on the stairs, and the husband walks through the door and says, what's wrong? And she says, I just found out I have cancer. And he says, what's for dinner? And she looks at him, and they get up and make dinner. And then 20 years later, they're sitting in her office, in my office, saying, we have had distress in our relationship, and we don't know how to get past it. And when you ask this question, was there ever a moment in time when you felt like he wasn't there for you? She answers, yes, it was that moment on the stairs when I needed you. Will you be there for me when I really need you? And you weren't there for me. And he says, what are you talking about? Because she never mentioned it, but for her it became that indelible imprint that she couldn't think her way past. Those are these moments. So that you'll notice them because people talk in life and death terms. They have physiological arousal around it, fight, flight, and freeze responses, hypervigilance, avoidance and numbing, and rumination about the, the very small details. That's how you know you're in, in that space. So I'd be happy to talk more if you have questions about what does this actually look like and, and, and what would be an example. But what people have to do to get past these is, first of all, you have to be able to name them and know what they are. Otherwise, you don't know what the phenomena is. You have to help people to be able to construct an integrated narrative around it. They have to be able to talk about the meaning and consequences of the event. It's not about right and wrong. It's about that underlying implicit level. In the moment of talking about it, they have to be able to regulate, again, optimum level of arousal, not too much, not too little, and begin to integrate the emotion in. And through that experience, what happens is it literally overrides everything, literally in that moment in time. And I talk about it like it spirals away. They're able to experientially sense whoever the other is listening and provide kind of a healing context. Now, in talking to Howard about this, and when I've seen the beautiful work that, that practitioners have done in restorative justice, I say, you don't know it, but this is it. This is what you've just created with all of that hard work of holding and creating safety. You're creating one of these moments of meeting that have to be so well structured that this is the phenomena that's happening. And literally what you're doing in that moment is you're rewriting in the brain everything because it's powerful and persuasive enough. And it speaks at the right level to what's actually going on that words can't explain. When your gut gets it, you know it's true. And, and I believe that's what it is. So in restorative justice, I want to say these key moments for healing and for hurt, we have to be really careful to be able to make sense of these key moments. They're about safety and danger. They're about that amygdala arousal. It's about alarm bells going off. And when people bring a history with them, where people haven't been there for them, they are going to be much more, um, much more vulnerable to um, not feeling secure. But the great news is, if we can work on this deeper level with these implicit processes and know some of this, not only can we avoid these ruptures, but we can actually facilitate these bonding events that actually override that. And my husband and I actually coined a term that we call affect narrative which is too often people tell stories the same repetitive way. And what we call, why we call it affect narrative is it's telling the story in an emotionally um, engaged, implicit way. And when you speak from that place, that's the, the magic that can actually shift something from dangerous to safe. So we've talked about process, moving things, not just being explicit, but moving to the implicit. 
being able to attend to those safety and danger by now, you know, gaining social intelligence, uh, being able to name those moments of meetings that are facilitated and helpful, but also name those moments where ruptures happen, big, big ruptures, and then those small micro ruptures. And then we come back to attachment again, the in-between. And Jim Cohen, who's in the book that Christian and I just wrote, who's a neuroscientist at UVA, actually coined a term called social baseline theory. And what he says is we used to think the individual is the baseline. And I know many of you already know this is not true, just by lived experience. But that the, the social unit is actually the baseline. That's where we need to begin. And it is not healthy to be alone. It's not healthy to not have social connection. And so activating that social engagement system for ourselves, but in our work with others is tremendously significant because it is wired in. It's how we were created to survive. Uh, and Jim, actually, you can see it on YouTube if you'd like to. He talks about um, um, his experiment, why we hold hands. He actually puts people in the fMRI machine and he gives them a shock. Uh, and he sees what happens. And if you are holding the hand of a stranger uh, or of your partner, um, it is, um, helps you to deal with the threat response uh, of what happens. And this is where his idea of social baseline theory actually came from. And um, his, his study is wonderful. They actually he just ran, um, they just ran another study with my trainer, Sue Johnson, uh, in EFCT and um, using, uh, using the home holding experience and got amazing results of not just helping with couple distress, but actually rewiring, helping people rewire their brains for safety. But in this, this is about the practitioner is a regulator, that your capacity to use social engagement uh, is, is one of your most powerful tools. And so your ability to, to activate that attachment system with the people you're working with uh, is really important. But here's, here's the rub a little bit, is you bring your own history with you as well. And so this is where knowing where you come from and what you do during stress is tremendously significant because you will impact the environment around you. So doing work to figure out, are you too over-regulated and not accessible to people, too under-regulated and you get anxious, or are you just about right? Uh, and then how does that interact with the people that you're working with? So as practitioners, you have to know your own music uh, as well as the music that sings around you, I believe, to be most effective. So I think I'm about done talking here. Just to say, I think intervention really needs to be moving beyond thinking and reasoning. Uh, interventions really need to value not just the explicit information that we have, but paying attention to the more intuitive uh, dynamics on the inside. Uh, knowing well, what I would say, knowing within and beyond, uh, where you're 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 not necessarily thinking about all the pieces of information, but you have this ability to take large amounts of information uh, and to work with it, and then recognizing how you impact other people and how people impact one another, um, I believe is tremendously significant. Uh, and then marking these key moments, uh, and I think this is something I'm still growing in, is really really beginning to play with and um, to notice uh, these moments that have transformative potentials. And I use that word intentionally. I really, really believe transformation is possible. So knowing how injuries happen, knowing some of the phenomena around that, I believe would be tremendously helpful, uh, not just in our work, but in our larger world. And also really valuing that the opportunities for repair are almost as significant as the opportunities um, for bonding in the first place. So um, just, just because there's a rupture or just because there is um, a, a lack of, of connection um, isn't a bad thing. And I wanted to show you a video today, but, but videos don't run on this. So I hope you'll look it up on YouTube if you haven't seen it before. It's the Still Face Experiment with Ed Tronics. You can find it very easily on YouTube. And he shows what happens in mother-infant interactions in a very brief period of time when a mom is attuned and responsive and then does a still face and gives nothing to the baby. You see instantly that baby protests, like we talked about earlier, goes to clinging and seeking, starts to get dysregulated, and then eventually just begins to wail. In that very short clip, 
that's what happens for all of us when we're in that distress. And, and we push back and, and we do certain things. But the beautiful thing is secure attachment is built in that music of rupture and repair. That's where security is built. So I want to say it's not always in the getting it right where healing happens. It's in going back and repairing the mistake. It's in going back and repairing the mistake. So actually, those really, really strong bonds can be built. So, um, yeah. So I think I'll just end with saying it's about process. I hope, again, not the pragmatics, but looking at that implicit processes, beginning to look at that social, uh, social engagement system, uh, the optimum level of arousal, using Dan Goleman's work with social intelligence, looking at these moments of connection and disconnection. And then I bring us back to this piece of, will you be there for me when I really need you? We're just going to, just to simplify it down to the most basic things, I want to say that phrase right there really is the difference that makes the difference. Thank you. We're getting some questions, and one of them is from, a, from Brian, and he's saying, given my uh, failure to push that speak button before, he's saying, will you be there when Anne Marie really needs you? <laughs> <laughs> we have a number of questions. Do you want to say anything else to practitioners specifically before we move to the questions, or do you want to wait? No, we can, yeah, let's go to the questions and, and we'll get there. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, there's a number of questions around affect narrative, but before I get there, there's a, somebody's asking for suggestions about adapting uh, your questions to situations where the rupture may have been historical with someone else but now being triggered by a current person or event. What are some ways to do that? Well, um, I mean, that's an that's a excellent question. And um, um, some of the things that you would pay attention to is even though something is historical and even though something may have been done in another context, it continues to live on. The way you know that it hasn't gone away is it continues to live on in the here and now as if it's still alive. So it's almost like that that, that trauma narrative that an individual could carry where they're activated is actually held by the community. And actually, I believe, um, um, and this is just Anne Marie's opinion, um, though I do think there's some good research out there on this, that it actually begins to be carried through the gene um, in particular ways. The body begins to carry that narrative story. Um, so, so I would say that my my real belief, uh, and I've talked to, to to the faculty at CJP. I don't know Howard if you and I have actually had this conversation or not, but I really am persuaded that it's. And I was just talking with somebody today. Um, I do believe it begins in dyadic processes, and so if there's a way to go back to what actually happened, even if those people are not alive today, and somehow be able to evoke and tell the story not the way that it's always been told, but in new and different ways, it can loosen things up for people to begin to read story themselves into a new story. Um, so it's, um, and too often what we do with those old um, historical painful trauma stories is um, we tell them the same way over and over again. There's some wonderful research out there by John Gottman um, that talks about, I mean, he's another researcher you can find online. He's the pe person who puts people in the love lab and actually watches them fight and can tell with incredible accuracy uh, whether they'll divorce in five years or not, just based on their nonverbals. Um, that uh, people actually begin to completely rewrite history. So they can't even remember why they fell in love by the time they're divorcing. And so, um, I believe it's about restoring ourselves into a new story. And if it's historical, uh, we have to, to, to go back. I know it like in, in a church context, often there'll be some sort of rupture that happened. Uh, uh, some, a pastor did something in a church and it gets kind of not dealt with. And then they begin to build on each other over time. And what I found in working in this context is you can't work with the most recent issue without going back to the very first one. And those people might not even be there to deal with it, but we can't forget those. We have to tell the story from that place. And again, in an emotionally engaged, not too much, not too little way, begin to read, and that's where I would bring affect narratives in, begin to, to tell the story in a particular little way that can actually begin to create, create some movement. And I'd be happy to pull that apart some more uh, for whoever's question that was, if there's more specificity for me to okay, that. 
I would assume that this is part of the dynamic behind like these outdoor programs for kids who are in trouble, who probably have a huge attachment issues and forcing them to work as teams and trust each other. I assume that that's part of what's going on here. Is that right? Well, yeah, not only are they trusting each other and they're in teams, but you're putting them in a context that's very uncomfortable for them. So you get some arousal. Too often these kids are just shut down, right? You know, they're, you can't yeah. get to them. So it's got enough, it's got enough emotional arousal going on. And then you do, you put them, and what you're doing is you're overriding their disconnect. That protest, clinging and seeking to sit. These kids have a reason to be shut down. They've learned nobody's been there for them. Yeah. And our prison system is filled with attachment disordered folks because of their histories that were handed to them. So if we can reactivate and actually get people to be engaged with us, hopefully, and because they're kind of in an uncomfortable, awkward situation, it will actually override that system and do exactly what you're saying, Howard, get them to bond in ways they, their head would never let them do, kind of surprise them into it. Uh, and, and literally, it can, it, can, it can change things in a moment in time. Absolutely. And I would assume the dynamic between gangs is partly this too, trying to find a, a network and testing each other about what you can trust and so forth. Yep. Yep. That's right. Well, there's a couple of questions about affect. You know, uh, somebody's asking for some example of people with an affect narrative. Is that question clear? Yeah, I think I, yeah. So, um, so um, what I, what I would say is um, often, again, when we're attending to the explicit, we're hearing the story through the content. And so when we talk about affect narratives, um, and Jim Cohen actually teases my husband, oh, so you mean emotion stories? Uh, yeah, that's exactly what we mean. That it is, it is, it is being, again, arou you can't just talk about it. You have to have enough arousal that, that you're actually talking in a meaningful way. So um, I'm trying to think if I can think of an example not in the therapy context. Um, so, um, I mean, let me just use maybe, maybe a, a, a situation in the classroom uh, would be a good example, is when people are talking and maybe get stuck or there's some, some, some um, heightened emotion and so you can tell people are actually feeling things in a particular way. Um, oftentimes, if, um, if you're uncomfortable with really powerful emotions, you'll try to calm that down and get people to just be cool, calm, and collected. Or um, if I'm not comfortable with emotion in that moment, I might get anxious myself. And what we know about anxiety is it's actually um, contagious. So if I begin to get anxious, everybody around me is going to begin to get anxious. So when you're dealing with an affect narrative, especially if we're going to be telling a story, let's say a student's talking about something that, I, that they didn't like that I did, um, I have to be able to stay emotionally engaged, accessible and responsiveness, not have too much going on, but also be available to them. And then as they tell their story, it's exactly what I talked about with attachment injuries. It's connecting not just to the content of what they're saying, and too often people want to tell you, so in therapy, people want to tell you the whole story from beginning, middle to end. We don't let them do that. What you want to do is you want to hear the music underneath the story. So maybe it's having them tell the story in a particular way. Maybe using an affect narrative is having them move to the story. It could be using some sort of creative or expressive art in doing that. But let's just say I'm listening to that student in the classroom, and, and it's about me, let's say. I've done something that, that, that they're telling, you know, that this is just not okay. I want them to tell me the story in a way, first of all, where they know that I'm attuned and I'm actually with them. But I want them to tell it in a way where it's new, and I really get a sense of what's going on. So I may stop it, and I may may have them say, so right now as you're talking about this, how is this for you? And does it feel like I'm really hearing what's going on? Is this really the essence of what's going on? So I'm going to do things to pull it from that explicit down into the implicit and actually help them to begin to work it through with me in the present because I'm using this, con this context, this moment of meeting as part of what, what we're using to actually facilitate moving through. And what we'll know by the end, if that's been effective, is it will no longer be an issue. There will be no more um, emotional valence to it the way there was before. That's how you know that, that you've dealt with it. All of a sudden, I mean, this is what it looks like in, in, in the couples therapy situation. Couples can be fighting about issues for years, 
and what we say is you have you have um, you have a thousand fights, but you have one dance with a pursuer and a withdrawal. And if you can tell that story differently and in an emotionally engaged way where you really feel like your partner gets it at an implicit level, all of a sudden they're, they go, you know, it's really not that big of a deal. You know, now that I think about it, you know, it really doesn't bother me anymore. And you know, it's been dealt with. It's like something has been rewired in that moment in time and you're going, really? We've been working on this for, you know, a really long period of time. I go, yeah, really. It just doesn't bother me the same way. And I bet as restorative justice practitioners, you have examples of that. You have those powerful examples where there's so much emotion, there's so much intensity. You help them to tell their story in a different way. There's a bonding experience. And all of a sudden, this amazing thing begins to happen in front of you where it's almost like they take the process. Diana Foch is a researcher. She talks about transformance. There's this moment in time that takes over and people begin to wax poetic and these amazing new things show up. And that's the space where you know that you've actually moved through one. Just thinking as you talk here, there's a number of people like uh, restorative justice folks like Ross London and others that have been arguing that the central, the central harm of crime is the betrayal of trust. The betrayal of trust for communities and for individual victims. And when you think about some of the trauma that victims of crime experience, it probably connects to uh, betrayal, uh, experiences of betrayal that they've had in the past. I mean, some have talked to me explicitly about that, but it, it begins to make a lot of sense. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And 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 when you're um, when uh, it, when there, so there's so, there's so many levels we could talk about this, but especially when violence is perpetrated by someone who's supposed to care for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it, it that that because that violates that attachment system in a particularly um, painful and incisive way. And that for neglect and abuse of children can really impact people for the rest of their lives. But a, there was a follow-up question of the narrative, you know, effective narrative. Uh, how do we develop more of that intuitive knowing to help other practice, practitioners do so as well? Well, that takes us right to those slides. So can I, let me jump to those. Okay. Uh, and, um, you know, I only did two slides here, and I would love some feedback from the participants that kind of pushes me here so I could be thinking about it more. Um, but this, and this is the place where my, my, my research and my interests are most, um, where I'm most interested these days. So, so, um, I really begin, believe it begins with us. We are only beginning with mirror neurons and how, you know, if I drink something, you, you know, you're drinking it with me in your brain, um, that, that the capacity to influence people uh, um, and, by who we are in the world is, is incredibly significant. So I believe it begins with us and how we hold space and knowing ourselves well enough to know kind of what our sticky points are. The wonderful news is no matter what history you bring with you, uh, there's this wonderful term called earned security uh, that Dan Siegel talks about. Uh, and we can earn our security if we get into relationships that, that are helpful for us. So uh, when I'm, I'm, let me show you the two slides. There's the inside of what we need to do, and then there's the in-between of what we need to do. So let me just briefly go over the inside and say regulation, regulation, attachment is a regulation theory. That's what it is most basically. It is however life was for you growing up, it's going to impact how you are in the here and now and how you engage with people. The great news is that we can actually change uh, and we can grow. Uh, Richie Davidson uh, wrote a wonderful book called The Emotional Life of Your Brain. He started the whole affective neuroscience movement and he has a huge lab that gets very well funded. He's the one who puts the monks in the fMRI machine. In this book, he gives um, different qualities from resilience to outlook on life to focus. Um, a whole, I think there's eight of them. Uh, and he's got a little test you can take. It's not a standardized test, but it's a fun test to take. Um, and what he says is you can actually change your brain. You can actually work on regulation. And he talks about right activation of your, um, uh, of your um, frontal cortex, uh, which means that you're too connected to that fight, flight, and freeze system and how you can develop better left, uh, strengthen the left um, activation. 
Um, and you do this through mindfulness. You do this through, you can do it through meditation. Uh, so I've just put some ideas down, but I'd be happy for you to ask me more questions and I'll kind of struggle for some, some or maybe some, some things that you do that have been tremendously significant. Um, but I, I would say any kind of self-reflective engagement. Um, um, I, of course, I love therapy. And so I would say talking with someone, telling your story. Again, how you tell your story makes a difference. Going and talking to somebody and just yammering about your story isn't going to change anything. It's not powerful and persuasive enough. But if you can see someone who engages this more emotional, implicit, what I'm calling affect narrative space, you'll begin to see things shift. Um, so I, I would point to the Ricky Davidson book. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful resource. I really love Eugene Jenlin, and he is getting more and more respect um, recently. He worked with Carl Rogers, if you know those names. Uh, back in the 1960s, and they did this wonderful research project where one session of focusing, uh, which is this system of learning what um, kind of the inside, what's going on on the inside, and I'll explain it more in a minute. One session of that, that's it. And then you go to a therapist for a year. Any kind of therapist, any kind of model doesn't matter. After that year of therapy, the people who had one session of focusing did better. So this capacity to be able to attend inward, and I, I'd like to call it more broadly self-sensing, is incredibly significant. And there's a little book you can get at Barnes & Noble by Denman called Focusing, and it just walks through the steps of how you actually do it. And if you do that on a regular basis, you will, if you don't already have a really rich, informative internal world, you'll, you'll, you'll begin to build those skills. Um, so I'm sure I have more ideas than that, but that would, that would be kind of got to work on the inside, got to work on your own regulations. You are impacting the people you're working with. So the in-between, learning to read nonverbals, absolutely essential. If you don't know how to read nonverbals, practice it. If you're in training settings or working in a clinic, get your colleagues to help you. Create some scenarios where you practice it. Just some basic practicing of reading that like you would with social intelligence, tremendously significant. Also, there's this great, um, and Paul Ekman's research, he's the one who did the like micro movement of the face, every single muscle of the face, he can tell who's lying, um, like by just seeing like people um, on TV, um, created this test you can take. Um, it costs a little bit of money, but if you know this is an area you need to work on, you can actually take the faces test by Paul Ekman, online. Dan Goleman talks about in his book, Social Intelligence. And uh, you can actually, and there's these little split second faces that get shown with different emotions. Uh, and you can actually improve. I, I, I don't remember. It's like Dan Goleman goes from 40 to 80 after taking the test. Basically, you're training not your thinking brain, but it's training your implicit knowing self to be able to begin to read that. And then obviously, I would bring us back to attachment. Uh, and say, um, knowing your attachment style, and I'm not talking about that today, but I'd be happy to give you resources on that. Knowing your style, you can either be secure, uh, and let me just say this, it's based on your view of self and your view of other. View of self, am I lovable and am I worthy? View of other, can I trust you and can I depend on you? You can be secure, you can be preoccupied anxious, which means basically that you have too much activation. Or you can be what's called dismissive. Uh, so basically, it kind of goes like this. Secure, I'm OK, and you're OK. Preoccupied, anxious, you're fine, I'm the problem. Dismissive, I'm fine, you're the problem. And then there's this other category, which is called fearful avoidance, uh, which is I'm not so sure about me, and I'm not so sure about you. So it's kind of a push-pull. There's another category in the child literature which is called disorganized attachment. And this is um, what, what they believe is the precursor to dissociation. Um, it's somebody who's a trauma survivor who, who was raised by a trauma survivor, and you just basically learn to shut down. So there's these different styles. So knowing your style, which is absolutely connected with regulation, what you do with anxiety, could be tremendously helpful. Learning these patterns so that you know kind of how you engage with somebody else and kind of what happens in that space between. And then knowing about attachment injuries, I think is absolutely critical. And then I would say being able to bring us back to affect narrative, how you actually tell the story and getting good uh, at um, getting people out of stuck stories, 
uh, having skills to um, to know when when to do something new. Um, and it could be as creative as getting people to get out. In, in a stuck story situation where you know it's entrenched and it's just kind of gotten itself there, um, uh, I can give you more, I can give you, give me a case example, I could probably give you some ideas, but even just something like getting up and walking around, moving the body, noticing something, uh, can actually get yourself out of a stuck place where people just, it gets the kind of in this monotonous, stuck, uh, rote place, I believe can be, be helpful. Well, Jeff and Rensiger, who are, are researching from the same perspective, give an example of that. They say that often victims in, in a in, in restorative encounter will be stuck in this cycle of anger and resentment and, and so forth. That one way to get them to rethink their story is to ask them to step back and think about how they what happened and how they felt at the time it happened, because this is built up over a period of time, and that that could get people to reframe their story. Yeah. That's wonderful. And even with that, Howard, it's, we call, um, there, there's a skill that we call evocative respond. I and mean, we have a whole set of skills in the, the model I train in um, where we move people from secondary emotion, which is defensive emotion, it's what we often show people, to primary emotion, which is this underlying, vulnerable, real emotion. You have to be working in that space. To actually create change. If you're dealing with secondary emotion, you're not going to get anywhere because that, that comes after. That's a protective layer. So what you're talking about, Howard, which is interesting, is by doing that movement of getting them to remember themselves back, they're moving it to a primary place. Then you have something real to work with. And then what we do in that place is we actually use skills. And what you just talked about is we call it evocative responding. What was that like for you? How is that for you? Or we bring it in the here and now. Whenever you notice the story is being told in the there and then, it's stuck. Bring it into the here and now. And what's it like for you now as you're talking about that? Then that becomes alive, and then you can actually get some movement from that. So. All right, I think you've answered a couple of these questions. But one person asked earlier, how do you get the person to tell the story in another way? What's an example? I think you probably answered that one. You have more to say about that. There's a couple here around bonding moments in this world of justice. Uh, how do you, what ideas do you have for how to mark those key movements, moments of, for healing or harm in a restorative justice process? What are ways to mark those key movements, movements for healing or harm in a process? Okay, so let me think about this for a second because I want to I want to hook it to something and actually, so you're in that place. You're in you're in the realm of felt sensing. So you're in that implicit realm and you have to be comfortable there. I think probably a lot of you are comfortable there, but we don't get a lot of cultural support to trust our instinct and our intuition. So I want to say to you today, it is your most valuable tool. It is tremendously significant. And those feelings you get in your gut most likely are right question is what you do with them. So I would say for, for, for attachment injuries and also for bonding moments, that's the realm that you are attending to. What I, I and I, it, can be culture, it depends what culture you're in, with it, how much you watch the face, but because of my training, I watch the face from micro expressions. And in our culture, we're trained to give people in power the responses that they want. And that's what you have to watch for is you have to watch for, is the person giving me what they think I want, or is the person giving me what feels most authentic to their experience? Um, and that one is, um, that's, that's just a, a judgment call, a knowing, or the ability to check in and, and to figure out. We never want to try to facilitate bonding between two people until we have that sense that they're both with us in that deeply experiential, what I call primary emotion place, because it's not gonna work. It, someone's gonna pop out, someone's gonna get defensive. They may be trying, trying, trying with their head to do it, but if their gut isn't there, it, it, it's just not gonna work. Um, so, so let me think, what are some of the things that you can pay attention to? Um, faces, you pay attention to your own sensibility, 
you um, you know um, because you've talked about it and you've worked with it, you know the landscape enough that you can read the people that you're with. Um, you ask them what their excess are. You ask them uh, how you'll know whether something's too much. You need to know their arousal. Are they getting flooded? Are they shutting down and dissociating and going away? Are they just shutting you out because they don't want to be there? So you're reading all, and this is where it's social intelligence. It's not like I'm going down a checklist. It's like I'm waiting for a match. And when the match is there, and I know that they're both present, then I know that there's the possibility of creating something. But without that match, um, and, and too often we try to push things through just because we want them to happen. Um, in my experience, and maybe you have some experiences where this isn't true, but in my experience, it never works. Um, and so we just keep working until we find that place and we have that sense um, a sense of match. There's another question that related to that, but we may have partly answered, and that's how do we mark those movements without putting anxious people in greater anxiety? How do we safely mark those kind of moments? Well, this is where I think if you have, if, first of all, if you're super anxious, that, that that's going to be something yeah. you need to work on. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have, let's say you're working with someone who you know is super duper anxious, you've got to work on some of these skills ahead of time. So you've got to give them some regulation capacity. You need to teach them deep breathing. You need to help them to be working on at home, how to actually get themselves into a place. It might be that they do some of their own personal work to tell their story so they don't get quite so activated. But the other piece is, and I don't think I put it in my slides, it's this concept called the dyadic regulation of emotion. Basically what that means is if somebody is dysregulated, you work to help them regulate. You're gonna have the kind of relationship that's safe and secure, you're accessible and responsive, you've done the work that you need to. And so what you're able to do in that moment of time is to actually, and you've got a plan to do it, you know, I want you to look me in the eye right now. Right now, we're going to take three deep breaths, press together, breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Where are you? And maybe you, maybe you create a one through ten, and you already have a plan. I need to know that you're a four through six for us to continue, which means not too flooded, not shut down, or whatever it happens to be. Um, to, so you're getting, that's the space that you're working in as you help someone. And the more they get language, and the more empowered they feel, that it's not just going to rush over them and run away you're gonna have actually created a plan that you guys can lean on, which is partly the context that's gonna create safety. I don't know if this is an example or not, but I know a trauma therapists who ask a person to tell their story and then ask them where they are on the pain meter, zero to 10. And as they begin to mark it, well, I'm only at five now. It's a way of marking the progress, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. And what's interesting when you say that is we call it a SUD level. So you actually get their, their subjective units of distress to know where they're at. But basically a pain meter is exactly what you're doing because yeah. uh, we don't want them flooded. Um, and we also don't want them shut down. So it's exactly what you're doing is trying to find, find them uh, in that window. Um, but in that place, as, as we're, we're working with someone and helping them to do that, Maybe another way of thinking of it, and this word is a little bit funny to use, but when people tell their story in stuff ways, they're basically in a trance. In what? They've got in a trance. Trance, okay. Yeah, they're in a trance. They're in, they're, it's like when you're driving home and you forget that you're doing it. Yeah. They're doing that thing that has become implicit. So what you have to do is do something that pulls it out of that space. Yeah. gets them back in the here and now so that they can actually kind of create movement. And even just doing where are you at on the pain meter, guess what it does? Brings them out of that trance and gets them to be in the here and now with you. I found that as an interviewer, like with my victim book and so forth, is you have to ask a question and get them out of that. Yeah. That, that routine story, that really hurt story. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you do it naturally, so that's great. Mm -hmm. um, Somebody's asking, is there a way to reframe that question? Uh, I think they mean the question of will you be there for me and other ways to use it, since that might not be the most appropriate thing to use in way to use in every context. Oh, it would be great if somebody gave me an example of like a context and how you would do it, but let me just think some through in my head. You know, so you can say, have you felt like people have been there for you? Uh, and it can be institutions. Have institutions been there for you? Have you felt dropped by them? Was there ever a moment in time when you felt dropped by this person that you're so angry with? Um, it can be a society. 
It can be a family. It can be, so you don't have to use this. And you'll hear people say this in movies. They'll say, you know, that person just wasn't there for me. Or, you know, that it was amazing. I felt like, you know, the, the community center was there for me in a way that I never expected. So mm -hmm. what they do is they personify these institutions. Uh, and this gets to a whole other thing with attachment injuries is uh, we have injuries to larger institutions that we, we project um, connection with that don't even know that they're connected to us. And it can have very, very powerful negative implications. And as leaders, especially, it's very difficult. Uh, and so learning to say you're sorry, not that you were wrong, but learning to say, I'm so sorry that that hurt you is tremendously important in that kind of rupture and repair. That's, a, that's another thing, but, but yeah. There's a couple of questions that go back to probably something you've talked about. One of them is can you specifically, if you talk specifically about neural pathways, how they work and how they influence, can you say a bit more about neural pathways? Well, I, 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 like I said, I'm not a neuroscientist, so no, I can't tell you exactly how they work, but I can tell you some pieces that have been tremendously significant for me. Like I said, um, you know, for me, neuroplasticity, back when I was trained, people just didn't think, they thought, you know, the brain got established and it was basically a done deal and you were losing, you were losing things from there. Well, the brain does change, wonderful news. Uh, and we're just learning more and more about how. About how. Um, there's also kind of this idea of neurogenesis uh, and there's this whole field of epigenetics. So I can't speak to that, but, but, but people are beginning to, to really um, study into the fact that we can have tremendous change uh, on on who we are uh, in in all kinds of ways that we never even anticipated. So what happens with neural pathways, the way that I understand it, is um, um, let's look, let's talk maybe about a trauma story. That what happens when you tell the same story the same way over and over again? It's like it's creating connections. Uh, that um, Dan Siegel says it this way: neurons that fire together wire together. So it's this idea that when you keep doing the same thing over and over again, this is where the connections are being built. And so it begins, they call it deep grooves. It begins to build these deep grooves in the brain. And it's like a, like a track that you run your finger in the dirt. It just gets deeper and deeper. And then your finger just goes, through, goes in that track. It just, you no, know, that's what it does. It goes in the track. And the deeper it gets, you need something powerful and persuasive enough to get you off that track in order to be able to shift things. So you don't just go back to that, to that same way of doing things. And so it's the same idea. If we're trying to create new neural pathways that actually wire things in different ways uh, to help people um, to, to do things differently than they have before. And experience and encounter is probably the, because of the attachment system, is probably one of the most powerful and effective ways of doing that also in times of danger and threat. That's why things during danger and threat, some of the most powerful bonding moments happen uh, when people lean on each other during times of, of very serious threat, and the opposite is true. Um, uh, Bessel van der Kock, I think, is the one who said, um, it's not what trauma you suffer, but whether you suffer it alone that makes the difference. Mm -hmm. And so again, that spatial baseline, we're meant to be in relationship together with each other. Um, if you want to know more about that, in, our, in the book that Christian and I just edited, um, Dan Siegel uh, has two chapters, one on attachment and one that talks about um, th these pieces, um, and Jim Cohen also talks about it. So that, that would be a great resource, and you can also get those videos for free up on YouTube. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you can watch them um, and, and hear, some, hear them describe this. They do it in very, very accessible ways. I heard a neuroscientist one time who was observing restored competence, and he, he said the reason this thing works is because our brains are wired to connect with each other, and nothing rewires the neural pathways quicker than the experience of empathy, because that's the way our, our brain is built. It's the way our brains are built, that's beautifully put, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, somebody wanted to know who developed attachment styles and what the fourth one was again. They wanted to, could you okay. repeat that? Sure. So, so um, a little bit about the history. So John Bowlby is the one who originated the theory. What he was the name? Worked, what was that? What was his name? John Bowlby, B-O-W-L-B-Y. Okay, yeah, okay. And he's on my reference list um, on, the, on the PowerPoint. So you can read that. A great accessible book by him is called A Secure Base. He's got a three volume series that's bigger, but A Secure Base. He worked with a woman named Mary Ainsworth 
uh, and she actually settled her life here uh, in the valley in Charlottesville. Uh, we have the attachment clinic just an hour from us. And um, she's the one who actually, um, and, then, and then the work was furthered by a woman called Mary Maine. And they were working at that point um, on child, um, child caretaker attachment. Since then, it has developed into adult attachment, and I put that as a resource too. And probably the best book is called Adult Attachment in Adulthood by Nicolancer and Shaver. That's on the resource list as well. So these attachment styles are a little different when we're talking about children and caretakers versus adults, but they're basically the same. And so um, these styles, um, again, there's been a tremendous amount of research. Uh, Mary Ainsworth used what was called the strange situation, where they would put a child in front of a mirror with the parent, have the parent leave, and then the parent come back, and they would watch the reunion behavior, and they would categorize what happened in these styles. And Mary Maine does what's called an adult attachment interview, and then and, and actually works um, in understanding both the parent and the child's attachment. Um, and Dan Siegel talks about Mary Maine's uh, with specificity in the book, I think. Um, and um, so the categories, and there's other people who have made it more fluid than this, um, but for our purposes, um, I'll just name them in the quadrant. It's secure, if you want to think about it as a, a square, up in the upper left-hand corner is secure. Up in the upper right-hand corner is what's called preoccupied anxious or ambivalent. Down in the bottom left-hand corner is what's called dismissive. And what's in the right-hand corner is called fearful avoidance. And then this is not in the adult literature, but in the child literature is what's called disorganized attachment, which doesn't fit on that matrix at all. Then there is this thing, and that's bit about view of self and view of other. So those would be the two axes, view of self and view of other. There's also this that you probably, some of you have heard about reactive attachment disorder. That is the disorder of having no attachment figure. So when we talk about attachment styles, we're talking about what happens in relationship with our caretakers. For those children who have nobody in the world, they, they develop what's called reactive attachment disorder. And those children have great, um, because they protest clinging and seeking despair, depression, many of them have shut down, lack empathy. That's where um, um, we see some of the distressing behaviors that can lead to, to, to violence and to, to other things. We have about oh, seven minutes left before we need to start winding down. Uh, there's a follow-up question that says, what about what people don't know each other? You know, was there a moment in time when you felt something wasn't there, somebody wasn't there for you? It doesn't make sense. We just don't know one another. How do you frame it when in that situation? So you can ask about the moment itself, kind of what for you, what was the moment um, that 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 the rupture happened for you? Um, now, um, maybe a way of thinking about it is this: because we're all part of the human race, any violation against another human being pulls at that system. It doesn't mean we have an attachment relationship with that person, but it's that human to human connection that's been violated. So you wanna find some way of phrasing in the kind of a socially um, appropriate way, the question of what, what was, basically what you're asking is what was that violation about for you without making assumptions of what it meant. Right. So we're trying to get again to that more implicit, implicit realm of what it is. Um, and so I would say, you know, it would depend on what the context is that you're talking about, but that's what you're going for. You're going for the moment, the marker that actually sunk in for the person and said, this is dangerous, this is horrible, what, whatever, however they, they make sense of it inside of themselves. You want to know what the marker, mo basically, let's say it that way. You want to know what the marker moment was. So come up with whatever word, whatever phrase feels most helpful to get you kind of get into that marker moment. You may have answered this, but someone's asking wants to know more about how to get to the primary emotion. How, how do you get to that? That's a great question. So there's lots of writing on emotion With theory. five minutes left, we ask you this big hard oh, question. Right. <laughs> um, and I have some great resources and, and I'd be happy to, to, to provide them. But you think about secondary is protective and there are what's called categorical emotions. There are things that happen that lead to certain emotions in certain situations. So if someone is violated, 
the emotion is anger and fighting back at that. But too often, that's not what happens. Somebody doesn't feel safe to be angry, so their secondary response is to be sad or to feel ashamed. So what we have to do is get them down to the primary experience because emotion is, that's where the action tendency is going to be. We help them to access what's really going on. Or the other way, maybe somebody feels safer being angry. You don't have to go any further than a relationship at home, possibly. Easier to yell than to talk about feeling hurt and feeling like somebody's not there for you. So we have to help someone. We talk about we reflect and validate secondary. That makes sense to me that you feel angry. I can hear you feel so frustrated. We bring it down to primary. We help people to then say, and in the sense that I get is it's like, it's almost, and we always reframe this in terms of attachment needs and wants. And the, the sense that I get is it's like they weren't there for you. The anger comes from this place of they're not being there for you. And then what we do is we create what you do in restorative justice, we create enactment. When we know we have the person in the primary place, we have them speak from that place to the other person. And that's where we actually get the shifting and movement. So primary experience is action tendencies that move things forward. Secondary emotion is defensive, deflecting, protective, makes sense that it's there, but you're not, if you stay at that level, you're not going to go anywhere with it. Ooh, well, we got people saying thank you. We have some people to thank you for your affirmation of felt sensing. We have someone saying, wow, more restorative practitioners should be trained in therapy and vice versa. Uh, yeah, I want to echo that. Too. <laughs> I'm a lucky lady to work with these students. Yes. So I think we need to have you do a whole course or a workshop or an FBI class or something so people can go into this more deeply. It's clear that restorative justice practitioners need to understand more of this. So thank you for being willing to spend this time with you. Uh, You're welcome. And the, the great resources, this web, we will put this uh, PowerPoint on the web, right? That's okay with you. Absolutely. And, Go for it. Mm -hmm. and you've got this list of resources there as well, if you want to follow up on yep. this. Yep. And I'll just show, I've got, you know, resource list. I've got a whole reference section, and I've got lots, lots more if you need them. So be happy to get them to you. And the videos um, that you mentioned, are they on the resource list? Yep. I put Eastern Mennonite University. If you just type in Eastern Mennonite University Attachment Conference, and then one of those names that you're interested with, um, oh, and I also no. have, you'll also come up. I do a talk on attachment theory that I did for the faculty. That one will come up as well. Okay, excellent. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to. I'll be back in just a second, but I want to turn it over to Sarah Rothschank, who's going to tell us a bit about what's ahead. Wonderful. Thank you again, Anne Marie. You're welcome. Okay, great. I'm just going to highlight the upcoming webinars and um, some other opportunities here through the Zara Institute and Center for Justice and Peace Building. Let's get these slides up here. Okay, February 18th, there will be a critical conversation with the new Jim Crow with Jacqueline Roebuck Sacco and guests. And March 19th, Possibility or Pipe Dream, a restorative justice social movement with Dana Green and Carl Stauffer. In April, there will be um, one on the topic of restorative justice and the arts with Jane Golden. And in May, restorative justice and neuroscience with Cheryl Talley. And you can follow that, that link below for more information and registration. Um, SPI, the Summer, for, the Summer Peace Building Institute is another program um, under the Center for Justice and Peace Building. And we have um, lots of intense week-long courses available. Two that are restorative justice-based are the impact of social issues on restorative justice, May 15th through 23rd, and restorative justice, the promise, the challenge, May 26th through June 3rd. You can sign up for those specific classes or any other classes related to SPI at that link below. STAR is Strategies for Trauma Awareness and Resilience, yet another program under the Center for Justice and Peace Building. And STAR Level 1, it will be held February 24th through 28th, and then May 26th through June 3rd during SPI here at EMU. And then STAR Level 2, April 28th through May 2nd, all of those will be held at EMU in Harrisonburg. And again, follow that link below for more information and registration. And lastly, the Masters in Conflict Transformation is the MA program here at CJP. 
Um, this offers practice-based curriculum, and as you can see, explores nonviolent and restorative responses to conflict. Some other, um, the class is really focused on restorative justice, psychosocial trauma, and other specialties that you can see below. And for more information on the graduate program here, follow that link below. Thank you so much. Not sure where we're getting that feedback. Uh, the webinar. Dovetail nicely with this one. So uh, I urge you to can connect with that and as well as the other ones. So thank you very much for joining us again this afternoon. We hope to see you uh, on further ones. And uh, be sure to look on our website to find uh, this PowerPoint and the uh, resources there. So thank you to all of you who have attended. Thank you, Henry. Thank you for Brian who uh, for helping us get through this. And have a good evening. <laughs>